let's go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome everybody and um, welcome back. Uh, make sure, uh, just a little reminder, keeping track of your attendance here for the CEU CFB credits. And for those that uh, joined us um, after I mentioned it, today's kind of icebreaker in the chat box is, is what is your favorite tree? So uh, be sure to populate the chat box there with, with that answer. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's uh, Kristen and I uh, leading today um, and uh, Patricia may, may or may not jump in uh, a little bit during the course, but uh, we're going to be with you today. So just as a reminder, uh, try to keep your phone, uh, you know, uh, if you're using a phone, turn off the computer speakers to avoid that feedback. And we're going to keep our, our lines muted as, uh, unless we're speaking with the group. But at this point, we're a year into this uh, virtual setting. So I think all of us have perfected perfected our online um, presence here a little bit. So again, uh, Kristen and I are going to be leading the charge today. I'll, I'll do the first part of today, um, kind of the discussion period. We have a little activity for you to pl uh, plan today. And then uh, Kristen is going to provide the lecture uh, three slides uh, as well. So uh, this is uh, today's agenda. Uh, a little bit of step two recap a uh, little step three introduction, and then we'll, we'll talk about the assignment and the homework for next week. Uh, are there any general questions before we get started? I just want to make sure, ask if there are any general questions. All right, so let's go ahead and, and get started. And hopefully, um, you know, we can, we can jump in and, and think about a, a little bit of progress based on our, our last week's work and, and where we are now. So just kind of a reminder, uh, you know, we, we spent step one defining our area of interest, management objectives, and things like that. And last week, we talked and focused a lot on step two, um, the, the assessment, the, the particular climate change impacts and vulnerabilities uh, for our area of interest, for our projects. So thinking about the vulnerability assessments, the scientific literature, uh, we mentioned all the forestry uh, resources, the tree atlas, um, hopefully you had an opportunity to look at the agricultural resources as well, the Midwest Climate Chapter, the Midwest, um, the National Climate Assessment. So all of these ways of picking up some information about uh, our, um, our particular projects. And so if we look at kind of the key questions that we were focusing on, um, were these two here. How might the area, that specific area that you're working in be uniquely affected uh, by climate, clim climate change and, and subsequent impacts? Um, and how might the regional impacts be different perhaps in your project area, right? So we talked about this regional scale uh, for vulnerability assessments and then down to the property or the project area specifically. Uh, so this is really, you know, site-specific climate change impacts and vulnerabilities. As an example, here's the regional climate impacts. That's based on the regional info. So temperature, pre precip, things like that over the regional area. So for instance, uh, if we have a, a climate change impacts and vulnerabilities, we're looking at the region on the left, property or the project area on the right, or site-specific considerations. Mm -hmm. For like an upland forest, we can think of more extreme precipitation, for instance. Um, uh, more, more extreme precipitation events, that's the regional impact. So it's gonna impact things differently, right? At, at the specific site, maybe it means that the slope and soil on the east side of the property is more vulnerable to flooding or ponding, right? So that would be taking uh, a, a climate regional impact that impacts us all and addressing it at the site specific kind of uh, viewpoint. Another one could be increased potential for summer drought. So if, if you were able to watch the video or look at some of the impacts, we see a strengthening of the overall hydrologic system, an increase in precip, but also perhaps in, in intensification of drought as well during these dry periods. So for an upland forest, the site specific application could be hilltops, right? Being especially vulnerable uh, to growing season moisture stress. So this is an idea, and this was really part of uh, the week two and, and step two assessment of using the regional impacts to think about the, the, the specific impacts at the local level. 
Okay. So today we want what we want to do is we want to put on our thinking cap. Okay. Uh, we want to put on our thinking cap. Uh, we'll provide a, a, a list of the impacts. Okay. And we're going to select the top five affecting your project area. Okay. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss that and have a little bit of conversation. So in today's section, this little activity here, I'm going to put up the virtual board uh, that has the sticky notes again, listing the top impacts um, that were identified in your homework. So uh, we're going to add the sticky notes, okay, with the site level uh, characteristics that either made this impact more or less severe at your particular site level, okay? So the goal here is to make sure that you thought about all the key site level characteristics that can influence your vulnerability, okay? And just as a reminder, the, the annotate tool, so uh, you can use the Zoom annotate feature to add a symbol describing your project on the next slides. So we can go ahead and practice on this slide. Uh, again, if you go up to annotate, and we select under draw maybe or stamp the check mark. Then you should be able to put a check mark on, on your screen. So I see Chris has done it, Vicki, Jinwon, Jessica, looks like we're all able to annotate pretty well. All right. Anybody having difficulty? Flo, Susan. All right. I think I think unless uh, otherwise, if, if there are any objectives uh, objections, let me know. If not, I'm going to go ahead and flip it over now to the next slide. So I think I can clear all drawings. Here we go, and we're going to go to the next slide. All right. So. Uh, this is the, the, the climate impacts here that you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, what I want you to do is use the annotate tool to highlight the impacts that you think are most important or relevant to your project. Now, um, you're going to want to select the top five impacts and place stars, stamps, whatever you choose, in the appropriate column. So where, you're, where it says your votes here. Uh, as a group or as a solo, you can dis uh, distribute your five votes any way you like. For example, you can elect to put all five stars or stamps in one category, or you can distribute the five across any of the number of impacts. Um, so just take some time here to, to use your five votes for your particular project and cast your votes in the appropriate a column for the specific impacts uh, that you see. So we got some folks coming on maybe, oops, that was not supposed to happen. That's not very helpful, is it? There we go. <laughs> so we're starting to populate things now. Some of the, uh, the expected suspects are coming up on the screen for sure. Mm. Oh shoot, I didn't think about this one. Mm. Oops, sorry, sorry. Let's try to move it. <clears throat> Yeah, when we both when we all go to the same place, right? It kind of stacks them up, but that's okay. Pretty interesting here. We'll take a few more moments and All right, maybe another 30 seconds or so. Anybody else got some? We've got uh, three stars, so maybe a couple mm -hmm. more stars. Mm -hmm. 
We got all five hearts. We got check marks, probably a couple different groups. Some X's on there. All right. Looking pretty good. All right, so it looks like altered precipitation patterns and seasonality. We have uh, several in, in that category. Um, can I maybe ask, ask or call on a couple of groups, um, maybe one group to start that can talk a little bit about that? Uh, we'd like to hear more about what you're thinking related to that item and your particular, um, your particular project. So I think any one of the groups could speak to that. So if you're willing to talk about that a little bit as far as your, your top five climate impacts for your area. So I, I can speak, um, I'm speaking from Agraria and um, our, the, pro the particular project that we're listing is our silvopasture pasture project. Um, but in general, our, on our farm, um, increased precipitation has been an issue in terms of soil erosion and um, challenges, yeah, challenges mostly with soil erosion. Um, okay. So. Are others experiencing that on their particular projects as well? Or any impacts? Or maybe you can talk about, uh, Chris, maybe how those patterns and seasonality and alter precipitation patterns are, are affecting you? Yes, yeah, so I was kind of thinking of it along the lines of the reduced soil moisture in the summer and wetter periods during the spring. That's how I was thinking okay. of that. And so how does that affect you? So we'll like be planting trees in the former field area. We've got some species that just won't survive if the field is too dry. Okay. Uh, so some species just will drop out. Okay. Any others want to share about that particular one? Uh, this is Laura from Flow. Yeah. Um, I think our concern is the increased precipitation we're supposed to get in the spring, which in some cases makes it hard for us to get out and plant trees. Mm. And then the drier summers. So trying to find the sweet spot so that we can get them in stalled. And so they have a start to growing before the summer droughts that yeah. we're getting. We're but a wet spring. More of. Very, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, um, you know, a wet spring and a dry summer, that's just an average season, right? <laughs> well, they're a little wetter and a little hotter, yeah. hotter and drier. So that does make a difference. No, absolutely. Uh, last I've... year, we asked the fire department to come out and, and water for us. So, but that's not always available. Okay. I was thinking soil moisture, since we're working with the wetland, uh, be, with altered hydrology, because, you know, it's paved all the way around that uh, from anecdotal data, the wetland fills up later and that would of course mess up amphibian reproduction. And I wonder whether it can go to the point with, with, that, um, with climate change that it might dry up altogether. Mm. Yeah, so big concerns from your wetland perspective. Yeah, and the altered seasonality. Well, we're talking about a vernal pool, so I mm -hmm. guess uh, one concern I had was if we get less snow, how might that affect the vernal pool? Um, because the change in temperature is kind of what triggers the salamanders to come out and breed. So just, yeah, I guess it's the uncertainty or the variability. They can mm -hmm. survive a year or two without breeding successfully, but Yeah, very good question, and um, yeah, so that, so it's on there with less snow, which nobody really put, which is kind of interesting from a perspective because um, you know overall here in, in in much of you know I just looked at snowfall across the Miami Valley. If anything, snowfall's ticked up a little bit. I mean, it's ticked down. I should say it's ticked down overall 
right? Um, but it's still pretty highly variable. We can still pick up heavy snowfall, right? Uh, even in, in, our, in our warmer winters overall, one of the things that we've seen is a lot less snow cover in terms of how much time the snow is, is on the ground. And so while we might still see about the same amount of average annual snowfall, uh, it, it, you know, kind of disappears quickly. And of course it can then, you know, kind of um, dry up and, and things like that with wind and stuff in the winter as well. So yeah, very complex. There was a, uh, anyone, anyone else want to talk about the patterns and the seasonality precipitation? We, we, of course, another one on here was warmer temperatures. Um, and so there were quite a few for that one as well. Um, or, and, and, and also the insects, pests, and forages when that sort of speaks also to the warmer overall temperatures perhaps as well. So somebody want to talk about maybe one of those two? Uh, this is Laura. The thing that came to mind for me was something I read about beech trees need like a certain amount of colder weather to germinate and to grow correctly. And we do have um, maybe not at our sawmill wetland, but other places in the watershed. And so that's what made me think of all the things I don't know about how warmer temperatures are going to affect some of our trees. Okay. So specific tree types. I think like regarding the insects and the past, like uh, warmer seasons and less cold winters, like allow them to, I guess, breed. Uh, so more than one generation in a season, so yeah, more of them. So we talked about in, in uh, you know those those pests and those those pathogens, multiple generations, more generations, um, increased resistance to pesticides as well through that process, and um, so definitely. And, and one of the things that that's always interesting. I mean, we bend these into specific categories, but I think you can see how a lot of these are interrelated and interconnected, right? And it's hard to, to pull out and separate some of these uh, a little bit differently. Um, I was trying to look and see, you know, if there were any big surprises here um, in terms of, I mean, we, we, we haven't had an ocean here in Ohio in about 360 million years. So <laughs> sea level rise is not a, a direct um, certainly a direct impact. We think about some of that in terms of indirect and climate migration from coastal areas and um, things that, that, you know, quite frankly, the Great Lakes region look pretty good compared to some of the, the future projections. So we can think about that in shorter term or longer terms. But um, so, yeah, reduced soil moisture in the summer, changes in, in insects, non-native plants, Increases in southern tree species, so things that can grow here and maybe outcompete some of the other species that we have. Um, maybe maybe we can think about, and we, we did a little bit. We mentioned you know some of the site factors that affected your site. So you think about your wetlands, for instance, that you mentioned. The types of species are there other things factors that really played into your specific site uh, that from these climate impacts perspective that you want to share? I think for, I'll, I'll chime in here, um, Vicki, step in. Um, I think we are thinking a lot about weed pressure and being able to make a transition happen in the, in the management implications of having more invasive and aggressive weeds mm -hmm. um, and staying on top of that to reach our goals and objectives. Yeah, and being a little bit familiar with that, we, we have a lot of these species that aren't necessarily migrating slowly into the area, but they're brought here, right, through transportation and other things, and then absolutely thrive, right, in, in, in this growing environment as well. Yeah, I would agree with that, Jessica and, and Aaron. I, and, you know, just in the, the last three or four years when my mother was unable to be out there every day. It's just, it's amazing how quickly things come back where there was no loose stripe or teasel. Um, Canada thistle was pretty much under control and it's just taking over and now reed canary grass has come in too. So I, I'm, and, and of course with thinking about algae bloom and Lake Erie and, and where we are located, 
I don't want to use any herbicides, but sometimes I don't know. I don't know what else we're going to be able to do. We're going to, are we going to have to do some controlled herbicide use and then contribute to the ag runoff and, um, and everything is just um, magnified by climate change, I think, too. I'm not a scientist, so so call me out if I'm wrong here. <laughs> no, I, I think you're spot on. You, you use the term magnify. Um, one of the things we talk about is threat multiplier. It makes it so much more difficult to control, and, and there's so many moving targets and moving knobs with all of this because of the interconnectedness that magnifying the issue is exactly exactly right. The margin of error is really slim, right? And and so we have all these pressures. So I think that's um, that's that's definitely something. Um, any other site specific? Maybe Susan, if you if you can think about your site or offer those site specific factors, maybe a little bit, or or anyone else want to chime in? What client? Oh, go ahead. Oh, that's all right. I, again, I, I feel like for us, the water uh, water is a huge issue. And Sinuan, you had some ideas as well of some of the things that you thought would impact our silvopasture pasture project. Yeah, I think for us, it's mainly just the soil. It's uh, really clay. So like there's very little water infiltration. So it's just a concern about how we're going to keep these, especially for the first year, how we're going to make sure these trees survive. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I do have a question about these impacts. Um, sure. None of them mentioned CO2 levels. And mm -hmm. um, I've heard that maybe our weeds are much more aggressive or some of the weeds we're seeing, uh, they saw last time the CO2 levels were high. So I'm just curious, you know, is what we can do about CO2? <laughs> uh -huh. Or is that why we're having weeds? Like, should we leave the weeds there until the CO2 comes down or it might so, be too late? Yeah, so there's a couple, what, what do we do about the CO2 issue? That is our societal problem. That's our societal issue right now is, you know, we, we have more CO2 in the atmosphere um, on the geological timeline than we've had in the last 3 million years. We've never seen it this high. Right. Uh, the last time we had really high levels of CO2, we have an era called the Carboniferous period. I mean, that was a period of really high CO2 uh, swamp. You know, we had, we were basically a swamp and here in Ohio, but there was a lot of a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So obviously, some of the you know, yes, yeah, some of those weeds really thrive. Some some of our crops thrive in a CO2 rich environment as well. Uh, that's often brought up. I, I think I, you're absolutely right. CO2 um, is, is, you know, not thinking of it more as an impact versus a factor or driving factor behind these impacts. It's certainly acceptable. I think it's something uh, to think about and can be adding to that weed issue, as you mentioned. Yeah. Which, which climate impacts do you think present the greatest risk and why? This might be site specific too, but I mean, anybody want to speak to what they think is, is the biggest threat? Well, I feel like not, not necessarily for our site, but for Ohio Ag in general, I think the water issue, like too much and not enough at the wrong mm -hmm. times, yep. has been shown to be a real issue with people's inputs kind of washing off, right? If, if there's, if they just get started before planting and get, have a big rain and same with seed. And then um, last, last year wasn't so bad, but I know the two years previous to that, I think water was probably the biggest issue for farmers in our area anyway. Yeah. 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 We certainly have had very wet seasons, except for this past year, it was a little bit drier, but uh, certainly wet, a lot of wet seasons here. So, and it's not surprising then that precipitation pattern, I think, comes out here in your votes as well. So, okay. Any any last thoughts on this, this part of the exercise? I want to make sure to leave Kristen plenty of time. Kristen, about 30 minutes you'll need today, right? Yep, that sounds right. Okay, good. So, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'm going to clear off our so it was, I thought, very good discussion about these, and, and obviously we'll, we'll keep thinking about these more and more. So let's go ahead and clear all of our drawings here and clear this out. So 
you should be seeing, yeah. So thinking a little bit more about the vulnerability. Um, so we can, you know, when we're looking at and, and thinking about selecting the vulnerability, uh, we think about how will those potential impacts um, from the climate change affect your particular location, but also that adaptive capacity. I've got my computer propped up getting a little bit of air. As Chin Wan said last week, I had low adaptive capacity in my computer when it went out. But that adaptive capacity, you know, the resilience, does the system have uh, have to bounce back from climate change or, or disturbance? And so that's how we assess the vulnerability, both the potential impact uh, as well as the capacity. So uh, again, using the annotate, rate the vulnerability of your project. Is it low, is it moderate, is it high based on your potential impacts and your adaptive capacity of those ecosystems? You could also use multiple symbols for different forest types. I'm going out to Okay. So in the last minute or two that we have, anyone want to give an example of their sort of anecdotes from your group, the two specific examples or site characteristics that reduce or increase your climate vulnerability? We can see a lot of lower and adaptive capacity and some spread about the, the, those potential impacts in general. Um, does anybody want to, want to, from the high vulnerability side, the very disruptive and low adaptive capacity, maybe talk about your site specific characteristics that, that increase that vulnerability? Annie, you have your, your hand raised. Was that from before? Yeah. No, no. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, sorry to be late, but there was a, there was a telephone pole across the road and I had to wait. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, one of the things that I'm learning about is the various trees in the forest and exactly how the, the um, adaptive capacity is gonna work based on age of the tree and also the type of tree. So I, I have a lot of beech trees. And when you look at the ratings of the trees, those trees are pretty much toast. And so that's one of the things that um, raises that high vulnerability. Uh, and we have a lot of oak trees. And so depending on how they decide, how they're able to adapt, but they seem to be fairly high on the scale as well, depending on, I guess, the different kinds of oak trees. but. So I think we have a lot of high vulnerability in, in our forest right now. Okay. So high vulnerability based on the species that you see currently? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also, um, I think um, we have a lot of young trees. And based on what I've been reading, it seems like the, the older trees have the capability of maybe adapting a bit better. So it feels like we've got to really be careful about how we, how we manage the trees at this point. Okay. Anybody else want to talk about a characteristic of their site that led them to, I don't know, maybe moderate vulnerability, even, even low vulnerability, the one we have there? I spent a lot of time looking at the clump or the climate tree atlas and uh, looking at the species that have a high probability or modeling probability um, of succeeding and with a, a one or two SSO survivability. And it just seems like some of those species are available in our woods and that maybe we're not in such a bad place, but we also have a lot of uh, 
I should have checked on the previous slide, uh, non-natives, and I apologize that um, that does seem like our issue, I think. Okay. So if the conditions, and that could all change based on, you know, if the conditions are warmer, right, there might be even more impacts or uh, maybe the vulnerability goes down if temperatures don't warm quite as much, you know, so there's so certain adjustments mm -hmm. there as well. I wish we could, I really wish we could keep talking about these. I think this is really fascinating stuff and it really drives home what we're doing. And hopefully we'll get that opportunity throughout the, the rest of the course. But I think uh, it seems like you've done a lot of thinking about your specific sites and those applications, the, the impacts of those. Um, and, and, it, and it seems like based on the conversation today uh, that progress is pretty good. We, we've gone pretty, pretty well so far in terms of uh, assessing uh, those sites. And of course, that work uh, will continue as we move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and, and clear off our screen. Um, maybe clear all drawings. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over now to Kristen. And she's going to start the, the, the discussion and lecture on, on step three. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. That was a great discussion. So I will be talking about step three. Three. All right, are you all seeing my slides and you can hear me? Sounds good. Great. Thanks. Okay, so this week we will be talking about step three, which is evaluating management objectives considering climate change. So in this step, we will bring together the management goals and objectives that you identified in step one and the climate impacts that you identified in step two to start thinking about how climate change will affect your management goals and objectives. So in this step, you will be weighing the challenges and opportunities that climate change presents and determine the feasibility of meeting your management objectives under current management. So in one way or another, sometimes step three feels a lot like step two, although they are distinctly different. So let's take a closer look at that. Step two is about how climate change affects the place where you are working. So how might climate change impact affect the area? How vulnerable is the specific site? And can it cope with these changes? Whereas in step three, we begin evaluating how climate change will affect the feasibility of meeting our management goals and objectives under current management. So in essence, um, can we do what we set out to do given additional stresses put on the system by climate change? And we keep these ideas separate on purpose because the site level vulnerability is drawn from site characteristics, whereas management goals and objectives vary based on the values and perspectives of the landowner. Therefore, due to climate change impacts, it may become more difficult to achieve some goals and objectives than others. In step three, we will be asking the following questions. Um, so this is where we connect climate change to our current management. How will climate change make our objectives more or less difficult to achieve? Uh, do our current management activities and goals seem feasible given climate change? Or do we need to think maybe about altering or modifying our goals? The first thing that you will do in step three is to identify climate-related challenges to meeting your management objectives. In this step, we'll be listing ways in which climate change impacts and vulnerabilities may make it more difficult to achieve um, each management objective. So for example, warmer temperatures and drier conditions may limit the regeneration of a desired tree species and make it more challenging to maintain that species into the future. And we'll really be focusing here on concerns related to ecological or environmental challenges. So don't focus as much on things that are not within your control here. So like global markets and policies are not necessarily within our control. Um, but there'll be a space later that we can make note of those things as well. Um, and here are just some examples um, of objectives from past projects along with challenges to those objectives. Note that these challenges are related to climate change impacts and they focus on how the management objective will be affected. So one example of an objective would be to provide sufficient habitat and protection for the eastern fox turtle. And one challenge for climate change for that objective may be that it's becoming more difficult to maintain 
those habitats due to drier conditions, fluctuating water levels, or reduced winter snowpack. So once you've listed your challenges for each objective, you'll begin listing any opportunities that climate change may create for achieving your management objective. And here we'll be focusing on ways in which climate change impacts and vulnerabilities will make it easier to achieve each management objective, or they may create new management opportunities. So for example, increases in small and medium scale disturbances in the forest may help increase structural heterogeneity within a sand or landscape. And again, we're focusing on ecological or environmental challenges here. And so continuing our example from before um, with the Eastern box turtle, maybe one opportunity that we're considering is that if we're taking action now to improve habitat conditions, that will in the long term reduce the negative impacts of climate change on the turtle population. So often the opportunities will point to potential adaptation actions, um, which is actually step four in the workbook. Um, but if you have any ideas at this stage about what actions may be needed to help adapt to changing conditions, you can make note of that and then you'll have them ready for step four. So as we begin documenting our challenges and opportunities, we can start to more clearly see how climate change will affect our project and we begin to evaluate if the odds are stacked against us or not. So from there, you will start evaluating the feasibility of your objectives, given the challenges and opportunities that you have identified using your current business as usual management actions. Uh, feasibility can be determined for individual or multiple timeframes, so we can be thinking short term or long term here. Um, if your feasibility is on the higher side, that means that your existing management options can likely be used to overcome challenges for meeting management objectives under climate change. So in that instance, your opportunities are likely outweighing your challenges. If your feasibility is more in the moderate range, that means that some challenges to meeting management objectives under climate change have been identified, but these can probably be overcome using existing management options. Uh, you may need enhanced or additional efforts to counteract uh, certain challenges or to promote new opportunities. And if you're thinking that your feasibility is more in the low category, that means that your existing management options may not be sufficient to overcome climate challenges um, and you may struggle to meet your management objectives under climate change. So then in the workbook, you will have the opportunity for each objective to make note of your feasibility, whether it's high, medium, or low. And now is a good time to slow down and consider whether you are going to continue with your objectives as you have them written or if they may need some adjustment. So if you're finding that you have a management objective that has low feasibility, this would be a good time to consider whether you want to continue with that objective or potentially change it. So climate change may make some management goals and objectives more difficult to achieve in the future, and there may be situations in which they need to be altered or refined to better account for anticipated climate impacts. If some of your management objectives have low feasibility or if they no longer seem sensible under climate change, so for example, that could be managing for a species that is likely to experience severe decline, then that's an instance where you might want to reconsider your management objectives or your broader management goals. So if we've decided that our management objective does need to change, then we're able to jump back to step one and modify that objective. And then you can come back to step three. One of the cool features of the online workbook is that all of your edits will automatically update if you revise them in step one. And then finally, there is a spot for other considerations. So this is where you can list any social, financial, or other factors that also will be affecting your decision to pursue your management objectives. So this is where you can detail why you might want to continue with a specific objective even if the feasibility is low. Or maybe feasibility is high, but it's still going to be hard to pull off for various reasons. So this is the area where you can make note of that. That other considerations column is kind of a grab bag of other items that you want to take note of regarding your evaluation and of management goals and objectives. So for example, here you can note that um, management challenges that are important but 
maybe not necessarily related to climate change. So that could be something like a need for more funding or staff time or landowner support. The take home message for this step is to use this time to ensure that you have created goals and objectives that are more likely to succeed given project projected impacts from climate change. So a few helpful tips as you are completing step three, um, the challenges and opportunities are related to climate change. That's what we wanna focus on in this step. Other management challenges or opportunities that you want to record that are not related to climate change would go under the other considerations item that we just mentioned. And keep in mind, there is a difference between step two and step three. When you're working on it, it may feel like there's a lot of overlap, um, but don't feel like you need to state all of the climate change impacts over again. Instead, for step three, you really want to hone in on the biggest management challenges or opportunities that you are seeing and focus on those. And we have a number of examples of forestry projects that have already used the workbook, including this urban example from Fairfax County that participated in our online workbook training last year. So we'll take a minute now to just step you through the first three steps of um, what they did so you can kind of see the process of those first three steps. So in step one, managers will define their goals and objectives. So for Fairfax County, their goals were to review and adapt their tree planting list, to identify and preserve the best remaining and intact forests, forests uh, to create best management practices for use of managing invasive species, and to do some targeted outreach to county residents to help identify and manage invasive species. So that's their step one. And then in the second step, they identified their key climate change impacts. So for them, that was increases in temperature, particularly issues with the heat island effect. Um, they were seeing more heavy rain events and really causing an issue from a high level of impervious cover. Um, another impact that they considered was the lengthening growing season, as well as the increased um, risk from invasive species and insect pests. So that is their step two. And then in step three, they identify their challenges and opportunities. So for their site, uh, the challenges that they were most concerned with included soil compaction, um, increased tree stress, leading to perhaps increased risk of pests and disease and a need for more resources for tree maintenance and establishment, and the potential that an extended growing season would favor invasive species. Uh, some of their opportunities included a decreased threat from gypsy moth, uh, and that's actually due to the wetter springs that they felt um, would help support and introduce biocontrol fungus, so that might reduce that issue. Um, and then they also saw the potential opportunity that um, more southern tree species might be adapted for that area. So they might have a larger um, list of species that would be able to be planted in that area. Uh, another opportunity that they noticed was a decreased use of de-icing treatments like road salt. So that was a benefit for their site. Um, and that perhaps public um, interest in shade trees might increase due to uh, rising temperatures. So those are the first three steps. Um, just kind of an example from Fairfax County uh, might give some ideas as you are going through these first three steps as well. Do we have any questions at this point? All right, I'm not hearing any. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat as I continue or feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, Instructors are always available to help assist with anything that you uh, may have questions with. All right, so as you are getting into the online adaptation workbook, there are a few things to uh, keep in mind. If you are having any issues or have any questions, we do have um, some recorded tutorials that are embedded in each step that you can view or of course you can always reach out to us. Um, and then this slide is just showing where you can find those um, embedded tutorials. So take a look at those if you're needing a little additional assistance. Um, and then just a reminder, as you are getting into step three, here are some pro tips. Those challenges and opportunities can be listed related to each objective. So you'll wanna click on add a challenge to add new text for a new text box for each challenge rather than listing them all in one box. 
And if you do feel like you need to reconsider your objectives, you can jump back to step one and the adaptation workbook will save your changes. So that is a nice feature. Okay, and here are those text boxes that I mentioned. This is just kind of a view of the online tool. You can see where you can click to add a challenge or add an opportunity and then where you can rate the feasibility. So high, medium, or low for each of those. All right, and so we have our assignment for next time. If you're still working on step two, be sure to get that finished up and then start working on step three, where you'll be evaluating your management objectives um, and then complete the homework following step three. And next week is our break week. So if you would like to schedule a time to check in with an instructor, for 15 to 30 minutes, we can set those up. And I believe that emails have gone out, I think already to some of you to touch base and probably emails maybe are going out today or the day after for others. Um, so if you would like to talk with us, um, talk more about your project, we are available next week. Um, so we can set up a time to do that and be sure to complete these items by next, well, not the check-ins. Um, I guess this, maybe this is for a normal week, not not a break week. I think you have you have extra time this time around. So next we will be introducing step four, um, which is covering adaptation strategies. We will not be having lecture on March 16th. So you have a whole week uh, to kind of catch up on things, or if you would like to read ahead to step four, you can also do that. All right. So we'll stay on the line if there are any questions or if there's any um, need for any further discussion, we will be here. Otherwise, reach out to us via email. Thanks. We finished a little early. Yeah. So we, we, we actually have about 10, 10 12 minutes. Yeah, if you would like to go back to the discussion, yep. you could do Absolutely. that. So first, are there, are there any questions then over section three before we do that? Um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, uh, like Don Scott Airport is pretty close to Sawmill Wetlands. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, would it be valuable to us to have more local data or is what we have already because of all the uncertainty in the modeling good enough? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really close, right? It's really close to your site there. So, um, and it's pretty, I mean, you're talking about specifically with the weather data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe maybe Patricia has, has a little insight. That's, I mean, your site's so close to that airport with that reliable data that I'm not sure that you need. Um, I, I always err on as detailed of information that we can get, especially when it when it comes to precipitation data, which can vary quite differently with even within, you know, a half a mile distance. But, you know, I think that's something that you can just assess for your particular location. I, I do think that airport data would be, you know, certainly usable, useful. Yeah, when you're looking at past climate data, um, that is certainly true. Um, when you're looking at the future climate projections, uh, what we've provided is probably as good as you're going to get um, in really highly valuable areas. Folks have put in the the time and the money into regionally downscaling some of these. Uh, models using dynamic downscaling, which can provide an even finer resolution for future changes. Um, but you're not going to see that in very many areas because it's so um, resource intensive. Um, and so the information that we provided um, certainly covers um, these areas quite well. And I mean, where you are on, are on the line to determine how well you're going to be able to take all of that information and then tell us basically, you know, my site is, is more vulnerable maybe to some of these uh, heat island effects or, you know, maybe it's all about impervious, uh, 
pervious surfaces um, next to the airport increased runoff, um, you know, whatever those specific considerations are, you're going to be able to kind of build that in to step two and tell us, you know, why you think those broad trends are going to um, appear better or worse in your area, if that makes sense. Thanks. <clears throat> so I, I had my hand up because, um, well, I had a couple of, I had a question and also a statement, but one is that I'm completely overwhelmed and um, the technology is not my friend. So I, I already sent a note to Patricia and I, I did leave a message also um, yesterday trying to figure out what to do. But I also wondered um, if there's other data to look at um, that compares other plants besides trees, because since we are going to be creating um, a forest, a food forest, um, bushes and like elderberry and things like that, which maybe don't seem that important, but they're super important for all aspects of the forest. And I'm not saying elderberry particularly, but I'm just saying there are all these other plants that we would want to be introducing with the in into the forest and I'm just thinking you know well we don't want to really invest in plants in bushes and maybe some of the smaller trees like a buckeye tree or a hazelnut or whatever um, if it's not going to do well if it's not going to adapt yeah, so I can totally understand the feeling of being overwhelmed by some of this data. Um, I've been working with the, the Climate Change Tree Atlas and the climate models for 10 years now, and uh, it keeps, you know, getting updated and uh, new information becomes available. So I'm afraid that feeling never really goes away. Um, but we're here to hopefully make it a little easier on you. Um, and so these check-ins that we're talking about, um, that's a great time to address some of these questions. Um, in addition, in your syllabus, there's a few recommended additional videos and readings. One of those is a presentation that the modelers just gave um, a few weeks ago that talk about, you know, so for some of these more common tree species, you have the climate change tree atlas, but then for some of these um, often uh, n like less common species or even, you know, cultivars or non-native species, we can use um, projections of heat and hardiness zones to look at how those species might do under a changing climate. Um, so that's pretty complicated as well. So um, we can certainly, um, you know, try to watch that video, but we can also try to walk you through some of that data. Um, and so I can pull together what information I have on some of those um, less common species, but because, you know, they are the less common species, we haven't, you know, figured out which of the hundreds and hundreds of species we should um, analyze using that data. And so part of it is really going to be left up to you to say, okay, you know, for this species, here is its published heat zone tolerance. And then if we look at the data for future projections of heat and hardiness zones. Here's what this area is going to look like in the future. And so if those heat zones are shifting out of your published um, heat zone tolerances, then we know that that species is going to likely have a problem due to climate change. Um, and so that's basically how we're looking at all of these other species that, that weren't rig rigorously modeled by the climate change tree atlas. Um, and so uh, I can definitely try to, I'll see what I have um, specifically for Ohio and see if I can get you some of that information. But unfortunately for, for a lot of those more uncommon species, we just, we don't have that information available yet. 
Okay, well, we'll do what we can. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll do what we can. <laughs> right. But that's great. I mean, I, I love that you're ready and willing to dig more into that information. One, one of the things that I know we're not talking about the sort of the spiritual or historical aspect of this, but I, from this class, just the, 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 um, the videos and everything I've seen in the talk, it just is so clear to me that my, my real work is to be a steward, to guide my forest through what's coming. It's like somebody saying there's this huge fire coming and you could do these things and maybe it's going to save the forest. And that's, you know, that's my ancestral people talking in their DNA in me. And I just feel the power of what we're doing right now. And so I'm a little frustrated with uh, trying to figure out the technology, but I'm going to make it happen. Uh, I'm determined. So thank you. You're, you're what we would call one of those uh, champions of, of the technological hurdle. You're <laughs> yes, so I am. For taking up the fight. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm coming sort of from the other side. I have a physical science background and I can relate reasonably well to the climate model uh, type background. But since I am not an environmental scientist or a biologist, I think examples that kind of match our area there in urban wetland would help me. Or you had mentioned uh, specific examples uh, regarding the issues with ash uh, that there's a lot of in the wetland, but dead, <laughs> that, that would help me. Yeah, Petra and... Uh, was it Laura? I think yeah. I already sent some specific um, ash examples to. So I'll make sure that um, I, I pull those up and send those to you as well, because those, yeah, are looking at ash and lowland um, wetland situations, and um, they're great examples of what other folks have um, done in those areas. Okay. Does anyone else want those ash examples? I, I would. This is Annie. I would like to have them because we have lots of ash. Okay. So Petra and Annie. All right. Perfect. Yeah. And then if other folks are looking for specific examples, um, you know, on one forest type or ecosystem or another, let me know because um, I'm pretty familiar with most, you know, not most, there's a, a lot of examples online right now, but um, I can find those examples that would best kind of match what you're looking at if they exist. So, and you can think about that and, and just let us know um, when we have our, our conversations or check-ins with you as well. So please take us up on our offer to do that. Okay. So we, I thought we had really great discussion over the individual pro, you know, impacts, climate impacts today and the projects and a lot of thought going into their specific site. So I think that this is a really great start. So. Awesome. Yep. I was just about to send you an email, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs>